Coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition, a seven-year-old battle over whether to build a huge rock quarry north of San Diego County may finally be over. And we'll show you a new memorial at Camp Pendleton for Marines who lost their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Joanne Farian. And I'm Dwayne Brown. Officials from the San Onofre Nuclear Power Plant expect to have crews inside the Southern Dome by tomorrow. They will assess damage from a leak and make repairs. A leak in the shell of one of its reactors caused a shutdown late yesterday. The utility says a small increase in radioactivity was detected, but the public is not at risk. Candidates for political office here in San Diego County have released their financial reports. San Diego mayoral candidates are leading the pack. Kevin Crow is a reporter for Investigative News Source, and he spent some time crunching the numbers. He joins me now with some details. Kevin, how much have the mayoral candidates raised? Well, the, the four major candidates have raised about $2.4 million total. Uh, Carl DeMaio is heading that up with close to $970,000. Uh, and Bob Filner, who's the only Democratic leader right now, was kind of on the tail end with about 213,000. And do we know how these numbers compare, at least the total number, to the last election? In 2008, well, this is about five times larger than it was in 2008. Now, granted, there were only two mayoral candidates uh, that had filed campaign contributions at this time, um, but still, it's a significant increase. And, and Kevin, finally, do we know who the large donors are? The candidates themselves. Uh, Carl DeMaio has donated more than $400,000 to his own campaign. Wow. And is it just Carl DeMaio? Or are there others who have donated to their uh, own some, campaigns? Some of the city council races uh, have sunk you know, between thirty dollars and $50,000 into their races as well. Okay. Kevin Crow, reporter for Investigative News Source. Thank you. I had a follow-up to the roadside call box story we've been telling you about for the past several weeks. San Diego mayoral candidate and Assemblyman Nathan Fletcher wants the state to stop collecting the $1 yearly fee motorists contribute to the program until 2016. The program currently has a $12.8 million surplus. Fletcher's legislation, if approved, would distribute some of those extra funds to all cities in the county for public safety. Call box use has dropped dramatically in the last decade. San Diego is fighting a judge's ruling. It broke the law by prematurely approving a plan to remove cars from the center of Balboa Park. The city attorney asked the court to reconsider its decision after rejecting an agreement with the, ci the city had with the project sponsor, Qualcomm co-founder Erwin Jacobs. Jacobs had requested the agreement to start fundraising for the Plaza de Panama project. The judge ruled an environmental review should have been done first. A memorial wall was unveiled today on Camp Pendleton for Marines who have lost their lives in Iraq and Afghanistan. 1,146 names are engraved on the curving stone wall, starting with the very first combat casualties of the war in 2002. The money for the memorial, $65,000, was raised privately by North County Rotary Club members. The wall is not full. Empty space awaits names of those who died in 2012. For the first time, San Diego's life science companies got a microscopic look at their financial impact on the economy. KPBS Science and Technology reporter Peggy Pico joins us from the News Center. Now, Peggy, we know San Diego is a major biotech hub, but this impact report covers more than just us, right? That's exactly right. This is an extensive 40-page report that examines all 3,500 life science companies in San Diego, Imperial, Riverside, and Orange Counties. Now, what companies were involved in this study and how many jobs are we talking about? Well, the report divided life science businesses into four clusters, basically biotech, including things like stem cell research, biofuels, medical device, and pharmaceutical companies. Those clusters directly create 97,000 jobs. Now that number jumps to 250,000 industry-related jobs when you, include, when you include support workers. And all those jobs equal about $17 billion in wages. And future job prospects look pretty good as well, right? Yes, that's right. About 6,000 more jobs over the next two years are predicted by the re report. Joe Panetta, president of Biocom, a trade organization here in San Diego for biotech companies, commissioned the report. And he says the data backs up what they've been saying all along. That is, the life science industry is leading economic growth in both San Diego, California, and even across the country. That is some good news. 
KPBS science and tech reporter Peggy Pico. Supporters of a state measure to raise the tax on a pack of cigarettes brought their campaign to San Diego today. The group faces an uphill battle to get Proposition 29 approved in June. Smoking rates in California are at their lowest level in 20 years. A state survey shows nearly 12 percent of Californians say they smoked in 2010, down significantly from the mid-80s when the rate among adults was closer to 26 percent. Even teenage smoking has fallen. The decline is primarily attributed to decades of state anti-smoking campaigns like this one. Secondhand smoke affects everyone's health. It's not just irritating. It can cause heart disease and even death. California voters approved paying for ads like this more than 20 years ago. What followed were bans on smoking in bars, restaurants, and most offices. Don McGuire was a two-pack-a-day smoker for 35 years. And I couldn't kick it. It took a heart attack for me to finally just say, that's it. McGuire actually had two major heart attacks less than 10 years apart. That's why he says Proposition 29 on the June ballot is a big deal, but needs voter support to pass. The biggest thing is, is catch kids early because it is terribly difficult to kick the habit. And the long term, from a health care standpoint, is that the ultimate end result will be all of us will be paying for somebody else smoking. The U.S. shied away from putting warnings like this one on a pack of smokes. This is what you'll see if you buy cigarettes in Canada or Australia. But sponsors of Prop 29 say they're more interested in using the tobacco tax to pay for smoking-related research. Jim Gogak is with the American Lung Association in San Diego. It's kind of sad because in California, we really, we invented the anti-tobacco movement in a lot of ways. But today, we're behind a lot of other states. And one of those places that we're behind is in tobacco taxes. Now, if approved, Prop 29 would provide nearly $600 million for smoking-related research in California. A seven-year battle over a proposed rock quarry north of San Diego may finally be over. Joanne and her guests are talking about that at the Evening Edition Roundtable. The fate of a proposed rock quarry north of San Diego County may be decided next week by the Riverside Board of Supervisors. Those in favor say the Liberty Quarry would create jobs and provide aggregate needed for construction. Those opposed have environmental concerns. Joining me to talk about the project are Dr. Matt Ron, Director of Field Stations Program for SDSU Overview, and Ken Dixon, a member of the Murrieta School Board, and Ken is a supporter of the quarry. Thank you both for being here. Very welcome. Glad Thank to be here. Ken, I want to begin with you. So tell me a little bit about the project and why you're in favor. Well, this project is a classic uh, case of a balance between economic development and environmental interest. And everybody knows that. Certainly, um, you know, both sides do. Um, I uh, have no affiliation, no connection with Granite uh, engineering, construction, mm -hmm. uh, but I am a member of the community that of Murrieta, so near the, near where this proposed site would be, and uh, been involved with uh, the community in a number of ways, school board for the last 14 years. And um, I have a background that I bring to this that uh, at uh, an early part of my career, I'm a retired Air Force officer, judge advocate, and for 30 years, environmental issues were part of my world, and specifically, I was the dedicated environmental council at March Air Base doing these things. So, so do you see curiosity. this is bringing jobs to your community? And sure. does, will it affect your house? You say your house is close by. Is it going to affect well, your home? Uh, I'm not right next to the quarry, but I live in a community that will be affected, and a school district will be affected by the cost of aggregate, uh, the overall environmental quality of the region. And I think we need to think regionally about this uh, because this is a, a regional asset. Um, royalties potentially left in the ground that would help with our budget for school any of that land? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. no. Royalties are, would go to the state teacher's retirement uh, when we leave natural resources in the ground. Those are dedicated to teacher's retirement, help our budget. Uh, that's an important issue, but when I involved myself just to the degree of getting informed like I would with what I used to do, uh, I created and defended EIRs in an earlier, I looked at this, was very satisfied for the safety of it and really was wondering what's the big fight about. So, so I got so, involved that way. Matt, what is the big fight about and why is SDSU invite, involved in this fight? Well, San Diego State University is involved because we are the uh, closest neighbor to the project. Uh, San Diego State uh, manages and owns about 4,500 acres 
in Southwest Riverside County that it operates as a research and education laboratory. Uh, for the last half century, we've been able to maintain uh, a strong presence in environmental, natural sciences, physical sciences uh, research, and so we'd like to be able to maintain uh, that ability into the future. Uh, this project represents a serious impact to the region, and uh, renowned experts from around uh, the country really have uh, reviewed the project and provided a uh, very thorough environmental analysis and have concluded that uh, significant unavoidable impacts will occur because of this and it would impact uh, the ability for the university to continue its mission in that area. So when you say what kind of impacts, is it air quality, is it dust, what specifically? Well one of the most unique things about this property is that it represents uh, I would uh, argue one of the most sensitive areas in Southern California. Uh, it has of course the suite of sensitive, endemic, rare and endangered species uh, but also the quarry sits directly in uh, the middle of uh, the last inland to coastal habitat and wildlife linkage remaining in Southern California. Uh, it's adjacent to the last fully protected free-flowing river in Southern California. Uh, and it also uh, represents, uh, from a cultural resource perspective, one of the most sensitive uh, sites to the Luceno people. So can, can, can I add something sure, just sure. Uh, unavoidable and significant impacts? has talked about a lot that that means uh, it's a very minimal low standard it means you study it and this has been studied it's passed muster through south coast air quality management district the air the water vibration light uh, fish and wildlife service have all passed uh, on this through the county process of the technical people uh, it's sensitive there's the issue of uh, cultural resources uh, the logical con extent of, of that concern would basically wipe out all of the development in the, the third of northern San Diego County. Uh, so these are all balancing, or things to be balanced, but they need to be balanced about the needs of the communities and as well as safety. And I'm satisfied myself, as did the staff at the county, that these, and these all these regulators, um, Granite did their job, they spend amazing resources doing this, and it passed that muster. We haven't got a lot of time. We sure. got to go now. Ken, just tell us what the next hurdle is with this project. Well, the supervisors are the decision makers in this. Um, I don't like to be <laughs> half uh, pessimistic. My guess is that uh, just the nature of the arguments, you have the facts, you have the law. If you don't have either, you kind of you do what you can. Uh, this will probably be litigated, but we hope not. Uh, it will not be good for the community okay. if it is drawn out any longer than it already has. It's been we'll like seven years of study already. We'll follow the story. Ken Dixon, Dr. Matt Ron, thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Still to come on Evening Edition, we'll hear about a growing movement in California to educate children in two languages. And we'll get a preview of a new planetarium show about black holes. <laughs> Tonight on KPBS at 8, legend paints it as a solitary, bloodthirsty killer, but a more complex reality is beginning to emerge. Wolverine chasing the phantom on nature. Then at 9 in a race against developers in the Rockies, archaeologists uncover giant beasts on Ice Age Death Trap on Nova. And at 10, an amazing array of senses that sharks possess is discovered through dissection on Inside Nature's Giants. That's tonight on KPBS. I'm Gwen Eiffel. On the next news hour, the Republican presidential candidates move on to Colorado and Nevada after Florida's winner take all primary. That's Wednesday on the PBS News Hour. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by It's estimated one out of five children in the U.S. speaks a language other than English at home, and yet the vast majority of these children are taught strictly in English at school. 
Our front terrace reporter, Jill Rep. Logel, tells us about a growing movement in California to educate children in two languages. From the hilltop playground at Los Altos Elementary School, you can see across the border fence that separates Mexico from the U.S. to the neighborhoods of Tijuana. In the other direction, you can make out the skyscrapers of downtown San Diego through the morning haze. Many of the kids at Los Altos are familiar with both of these worlds, and some will grow up fully fluent in the languages of both. This year, Los Altos started a dual language immersion program. These first grade students spend half of their day learning in Spanish. And the other half in English. A ever penguin can survive in Antarctica because... It's not exactly a radical concept. Bilingual education has been around probably forever. But dual language immersion programs are unique. Here students take classes in two languages throughout their grade school years and sometimes into junior high and high school. The aim is to strengthen the first language while teaching a second. Other California programs that include some instruction or support in a student's native language have one goal. To get students into English as quickly as possible uh, with giving them some support in their primary language. What ends up happening with that is that uh, many districts vary in how quickly they will transition their children into English. So really never allowing children to fully develop their primary language and then they are pretty much just put into English um, and you go back into the sink or swim. Many students sink. California Department of Education statistics show that English learners score lower on standardized tests than their peers. Fewer graduate from high school and go on to college. But recent research shows students in dual language immersion programs tend to thrive, often surpassing the test scores of their peers by the end of primary school. Some California educators think these programs can help bridge the Latino education gap. Plus, they say the world has changed since California voters decided to virtually eliminate bilingual education in 1998. But you have to look at, ultimately, what do we want these children to be? Do we want them to be able to compete in a global market? Yes, then it makes sense to maintain their language. Thanks to positive results, dual language immersion programs are catching on. California schools have added around 100 such programs in the last five years. Some 50,000 public school students are enrolled. Most learn Spanish alongside English, but some programs offer Mandarin, Korean, and German. Parents at Los Altos are thrilled. She says her daughter, Ana Sofia, loves the program. She can switch between English and Spanish fluently and with good pronunciation in both languages, without any ums or ahs. English-speaking parents also love the program. It's been wonderful. She has picked up um, the Spanish. It has become more, uh, more confidence in her to be able to speak it. Mm -hmm. And to be able to write it is even phenomenal. Many dual language immersion programs are located in wealthy neighborhoods where highly educated and involved parents demand such programs. But Los Altos serves a lower middle class, largely Spanish-speaking community. That's where parent education comes in. At a recent Latino education summit in San Diego, Dr. Cristina Alfaro ran through an exercise with parents. They discussed the positive and negative aspects of different educational models for English learners. If they don't have the right information, they don't know what to ask for. Despite their increasing popularity and apparent success, just 2 percent of English learners are enrolled in dual language immersion programs in California. California law makes it difficult for English learners to receive instruction in their native language. And because dual language immersion students often score lower on tests during their early years, some schools are wary of implementing such programs. They're under federal pressure to continually improve their test scores. That story from Fronteras reporter Jill Rep. Logel. A $5 million projection system will allow visitors to a museum in Balboa Park to view the sky as if they were in space. Joanne has that story over at the Evening Edition Roundtable. A new planetarium show and exhibition at the Reuben H. Fleet Science Center begins this Saturday. The new show is called Black Holes, The Other Side of Infinity. And the new exhibition, Black Holes, Space Warp, Space Warps and Time Twists. Joining me to talk more about black holes and the exhibition are Mary Dussault, Instructional Systems Specialist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and Dr. Jeffrey Kirsch, Executive Director of the Reuben H. Fleet Science Center. Thank you both 
for being here. It's a lot to get out there. <laughs> Ruffle. Great to be here. So, My Mary, re remind us <clears throat> about why black holes have remained such a mystery to us and what they can tell us about space. Well, I, I think black holes, they remain mysterious. They were an object that was predicted by Einstein's theories of general relativity and gravity uh, long before they were actually known to exist uh, in nature. And in fact, now astronomers are finding them everywhere in our galaxy and galaxies beyond. And uh, I think, I think they're, um, uh, they can teach us a lot about the, the nature of gravity and the nature of space and time because they're such extreme objects. And as the title of the exhibition says, they, they do warp space and uh, twist time. So. And Dr. Kirsch, there's something different about this particular show, isn't there? You have new equipment. Yes, where this is the first completely digital planetarium show that we'll be able to show because we've never had a completely digital uh, projection system that was capable of operating at high resolution, uh, which we're doing now. It's essentially four times HD. Resolution. So how will the experience di be different then for somebody who goes to see this? How, how will it feel different or look different? Well, it will look different in a number of ways. First, uh, it's so bright that you, the stars will appear right away. Usually in planetarium shows, you have to wait a while until your eyes da dark adapt. Um, and the ability to show a full dome show, which this is, means it's going to en engulf you much more than, than the standard IMAX, which we're still operating, of course, at the, at the fleet. Um, and this gives you a totally different way of appreciating uh, particularly geometric objects and um, things that have enormous size or very small size. And in this case, we're talking about the universe, we're talking about galaxies, and we're talking about black holes. How could you possibly uh, get a feeling for it? Well, it's, it's the goal of the uh, planetarium system is to give you that feeling for it because that's what excites people, uh, not only... Uh, uh, lay people, but also scientists, that these these things are so different and so imposing that um, you're able to see that this is truly revolution in physics that has emerged in in the last century, and the new century is is going to be something even bigger and better. Mary, do you think by having this experience, people will maybe feel uh, 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 not less intimidated, maybe by the subject, when you can go and experience it in this way? Because black holes, I mean, you know, let the, it can be kind of overwhelming, the topic. Yes, well, I think the, the two separate experiences are really complementary. Mm -hmm. the, the immersive theater show, Black Holes, the Other Side of Infinity, and then the exhibition in which... Um, you get to take control of your own learning. And so uh, in that exhibition, we try to place the museum visitor as a black hole explorer. So you don't have to be an expert coming in. You aren't expected to be an expert. You're expected just to be an explorer and to be curious. And the exhibition has a lot of different activities and uh, exploration stations where you can examine images that astronomers have taken that show evidence for black holes or models of how black holes behave. Um, and uh, so I think that aspect of the exhibition makes it accessible. And then when you go in the exhibit, you actually, um, the, the way you become a Black Hole Explorers card is by creating your own Black Hole Explorers ID card. I should have brought one. Um, you choose a nickname. My nickname is uh, Galactic Seeker. Uh, <laughs> you have choices of names. And you, you get a laser barcoded card which you use at the interactive activity stations and you collect your digital discoveries so you can collect um, an image that you really liked at an exhibition of an x-ray telescope image of an object of a black hole or you can make your own voice recording of a conclusion that you uh, made about what black holes are like and all those digital artifacts that you collect in the exhibition, your own voice. There's another station where you can take a video of yourself as, uh, as you're in a... This is incredibly interactive, isn't it? It's yes. very interactive, yeah. So we haven't got a lot of time left, but we want to make sure people know how to get more information because this starts this weekend, doesn't it? It does on yes. Saturday. Both, uh, both shows begin on Saturday. The show uh, opens uh, this Saturday. There'll be uh, two shows uh, daily and sometimes three. And um, also the exhibit, 
the exhibition, we've actually been cheating a bit. We, we started it because it was such well designed <laughs> that it went in earlier than we anticipated. So we've been getting uh, our staff accustomed to it as well as the, the visitors and, and the, the reviews are in a very, very powerful combination. We'll have to leave it there and we'll let the people at home know. Then go to actually our website, kpbs.org, mm -hmm. where we have links to both your websites um, and they can find out more information. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. Some new developments in the convention center expansion story. We'll tell you about that next. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Next time from Eugene, Oregon, it's Antiques Roadshow. He helped settle part of Southern Oregon, and he was a sheep farmer, and he traded a sheep for the powder horn. I had no idea. I hate a cliche, but I... I <laughs> That's amazing. You're kidding. <laughs> Mom, are you listening? <laughs> Don't miss our visit to Eugene next time on Antiques Roadshow. Monday at 8 on KTBS. The critics call it superb, remarkable, a stunning accomplishment. Just sit on the front of a bus. People could try to burn you to death. Powerful, inspiring, about as essential as you gets. Winner of three primetime Emmys, Freedom Riders. Your parents tell you, don't start something that you can't finish. Finish it. On American Experience. Freedom Riders, Tuesday at 8 on KPBS. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. There are some new developments in the Convention Center expansion story we told you about. Last week, San Diego City Council approved a finance plan for the $520 million expansion. But now, the city attorney says the most critical part of the plan may not be legal. At issue is the proposed hotel occupancy tax. Only hotel owners, not all San Diegans, will vote on whether to create the new tax. And that could violate the California Constitution. While well, city attorney Jan Goldsmith says he will file a lawsuit called a validation action, a legal process that asks the court to review the plan and decide whether it is legal. And we'll keep you posted on that story. Well, you can weigh in on any of the stories you saw tonight by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook. And of course, you can always email me directly, jferian at kpbs.org. And now let's go back to the news desk where Dwayne has a recap of tonight's top stories. Tomorrow, crews will begin working to determine the source of a leak at the San Onofre nuclear plant north of San Diego. A spokesperson there says it happened inside the Southern Dome and the crew will work on repairing it tomorrow. They say the public is not at risk. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night. We leave you with a look at the forecast.